Soul Questions. Why do ghosts say boo? People have been bellowing boo in some form or fashion for at least 500 years. But it's only in the last couple hundred years that it was actually meant to scare anyone. <laughs> That's right. For hundreds of years, saying boo wasn't meant to frighten people, but Ooh. alert them to your presence. It was basically like a sound you'd make to let someone know you're there. No one knows exactly where the word came from, but some experts believe it may come from either a Latin or Greek word, meaning to yell, roar, or shout. Other experts think it might be even older than the Greeks or Romans, and the sound was meant to mimic the low, guttural sound of a cow. But whatever the origin, the word starts showing up in writing more and more by the 1500s. But when did Boo go from casual call-out to creepy catchphrase? And more importantly, how did ghosts get involved? Well, for the next 200 years or so, Boo slowly but surely became more and more associated with all things spine-chilling. No one can say exactly why, but linguists think it could be related to how the word sounds. After all, boo is a loud, surprising noise that naturally sounds, well, kind of scary. Eventually, we start to see more evidence of the change. In the early 1700s, a Scottish book defined boo as a word that's used in the north of Scotland to frighten crying children. No word yet on why they were scaring so many crying kids that they needed a special word for it, but, well, <laughs> that's another story. By the late 1700s in Scotland, boo, bo, and buh were all used to describe all sorts of monsters, real and imagined. In Scottish, bacow was a word for hobgoblins or any particularly terrifying creature. There was also Boo Man, a goblin who likes to haunt people. These terms would evolve into the Boogie Man we know today. Already by the start of the 1800s, Boo is starting to be associated with horrors, hauntings, and all manner of hideous monsters. So it was really only a matter of time before ghosts got mixed up in all the Boo talk. Up until this time, Ghosts actually had quite the reputation as talkative terrors. They were often well-spoken, graceful, sometimes even funny or likable, and usually quite intelligent. Not like the classic ghost you see today, who only seems to know one word. By the mid-1800s, ghosts mostly stopped speaking so much and started to bellow boo at anyone they could scare. It's no surprise that Scotland might be the place that ghosts first said boo. Many of our most iconic Halloween traditions started out as old Celtic rituals. So, like many of our spookiest Halloween traditions, we seem to have the Scottish to thank for giving ghosts their trademark catchphrase. I guess you really know how to keep it spooky. What is a totem pole? Totem poles are carved wooden sculptures made by the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest Coast, from what's now Washington State all the way up the coast to Alaska. No one can say for sure how long people have been making them, but the mid-1800s was definitely the peak for totem pole making, once artists started using metal tools instead of stone. Totem poles served lots of purposes, and are usually grouped into six basic types. Heraldic poles, house posts, mortuary poles, memorial poles, welcome poles, and yes, shame poles. Welcome poles were as tall as 40 feet and possibly even taller. They were carved with different humans, animals, and mythological figures, then placed at the edge of a lake river, or beach to welcome guests or warn strangers. Memorial poles were built a year after someone died to honor the deceased, a bit like a tombstone. The pole was also a bit like a will 
because the pole was carved with the face of whoever was taking over for them. If memorial poles are like tombstones, then mortuary poles are kind of like a casket and urn wrapped into one. They were carved with boxes to hold the ashes of someone who died. They're the rarest type of totem pole and some of the tallest, usually 50 to 70 feet high. Some poles, like house posts, are just as practical as they are pretty. These poles are used as the big roof beams inside the house, usually two to four of them that help hold up the roof. Outside the house was another important pole. Heraldic, crest, or family poles were usually 20 to 40 feet tall and often had some of the most detailed carvings that told the story of their family, clan, or village. And then there were the shame pole. Also called ridicule poles, these petty posts were put up when a person or group did something bad, most often when they didn't pay a debt. Once the misdeed was made right, the pole was taken down. Like most highly skilled work, money was a big factor in who could have totem poles made and how extravagant they could be. They took weeks, sometimes months to make, and all that labor isn't cheap. Often, the artist who was hired to carve the totem pole would actually live with the family while they worked. For bigger projects, a head carver might even have a few apprentices to help out. The animals were usually ravens, eagles, owls, bears, beavers, wolves, frogs, killer whales, and a mythological creature called a thunderbird that made thunder and lightning. Totem poles were carved from red or yellow cedar, carved by hand, and painted using traditional colors. Black, white, red, yellow, purple, and blue-green. Why those six? Well, color options were limited by whatever natural pigments people could find. Black was the most common, since it was usually made from grinding soot or graphite, which could be found in a common campfire. White came from clays, limestone, or gypsum. Red came from a special clay called red ochre. Yellow can come from clay too, but usually it came from the gallstones of a buffalo. Blueberries, huckleberries, coneflowers, and wild hibiscus were used for purple pigments. And blue-green came from copper. Sadly, since totem poles are carved from wood, and wood tends to rot over time in rainy places like the Pacific Northwest, very few totem poles remain that were made before the 1900s. So, what is a totem pole? Well, like most art, it seems to have meant a lot of different things to different people across the Pacific Northwest. It's also one of the most iconic styles of Native American art. And there's definitely no shame in that. How were books actually made? Books have been around for many thousands of years. Though ancient versions weren't exactly books by our modern day standards. Ancient civilizations first started writing on just about anything they could scribble on. Stone, clay, tree bark, metal sheets, and bones were all used to write down information. It was the ancient Egyptians who first used a paper-like material called papyrus that was made by weaving tight, flattened stems of the papyrus plant. Eventually, they began gluing several sheets of papyrus together to form scrolls, which were basically just a long piece of papyrus or any other kind of paper that's rolled up for storage. Eventually, these scrolls led to the Codex, the first ancient evolution of written information that starts to look like a book as we know it. To make a Codex, sheets of papyrus or other paper-like material were stacked up, cut to size, bound along one edge, and usually protected between two covers that were made of a stronger material, usually wood or leather. Since each one was handmade and handwritten, Books in that era came in all shapes, sizes, and styles. Some could be simple, while others were extremely ornate, depending on the time and effort put into making them. 
Paper making dates back to the ancient world in China, but it wasn't until the 100s AD that a court official of the Han Dynasty named Kai Lun came up with an improved recipe for paper that made it lighter, cheaper, and more durable. China is also where the first movable type printing machines were invented. For the first time, a page full of characters could be printed out, then reprinted again and again without someone doing it by hand. At first, this printing tech was mostly limited to China and Korea, but around the 1450s, inventor Johannes Gutenberg introduced the printing press to Europe, likely influenced by rumors of the printing machines in Asia. The printing press was a really big deal because for the very first time, all of Europe and the rest of the Western world was now about to mass produce books for the very first time. Bookmakers no longer needed to break their backs, painstakingly handwriting page after page, only to end up with a few completed by day's end. The printing press could spit out well over 3,000 pages every day and without the writer's cramp. Nowadays, the text of a book is printed on big, oversized sheets of paper. Those sheets are sliced down smaller, then divided into organized stacks. Those stacks are folded in half and sewn together. The folded and sewn stacks are cut down to their final size and affixed to the spine of the book with glue. If you look close at the spine of a book, you'll probably be able to see the little folded stacks that make up the whole. And that's all she wrote, for now. Cause who knows what the future holds for books? We started making them by hand, then spat them out of a machine. Now we read them digitally. In a hundred years? Well, your guess is good as mine. Where did the heart shape come from? In case you didn't know, the actual heart that's ticking inside your chest doesn't look quite as nice as the heart shape we think of. The actual heart looks like, well, any other organ. Gross and slimy, with all kinds of weird veins, valves, and ventricles. But that might make you wonder, where did the heart shape come from if it doesn't even look like a real human heart? Well, nobody knows for sure, but there are three main theories. The main theory, believe it or not, gives credit to an extinct North African plant. You see, way back in ancient times, a Greek city in Northern Africa became very wealthy selling a super rare plant called a silphium. The plant was mainly used as a seasoning, but it also had another use. People at the time believed if a woman ate silphium, she wouldn't get pregnant. The plant was so key to the city's economy that they minted their coins with an image of a silphium seed pod, which looks a lot like the heart shape. As the theory goes, the symbol on the coin slowly became associated with having babies, then over time with love. The second theory also puts the heart shape's origin in ancient Greece and in the hands of the famous philosopher Aristotle. Aristotle claimed that the heart was an organ with three chambers with rounded tops that come to a point at the bottom. What description isn't exactly right? Hearts only have two chambers. But accurate or not, Aristotle's description may have inspired medieval artists to develop the heart shape that became a representation of love and romance over time. Hearts could be found all over the medieval world, from works of art, to coats of arms, to common playing cards. And just like that, the heart shape was widely known as a symbol of love and romance. The final theory for where the heart shape came from is also the least romantic. It was just a really easy shape to draw that kinda, sorta, maybe looks like a heart. Who knows? Sometimes the simplest answer is also the right one. Have you ever stopped and wondered why there's a specific symbol just for the word at? It has fun names like the snail in Italian and the monkey tail in Dutch. In English, it's just the at symbol. And the truth is, even experts don't really know where it started. The oldest known example ever uncovered is from a Bulgarian translation of a Greek book from 1345, which used the symbol in place of the Greek letter A in the word amen. But no one knows what it was supposed to mean. Now, that's just the oldest example we've ever discovered. 
Experts still can't say for sure where the symbol actually got started. One theory is that the symbol actually came from the French word for at, which is an A with a gave accent. And over time, writers started dragging the pen tip from the end of the A up to the accent mark. Ugh, lazy writers. But the most popular theory seems to be that the at symbol slowly evolved out of Europe's merchant culture of the Middle Ages. The theory goes that the vendors started using the symbol to abbreviate the term each at the cost of. In other words, instead of writing for sale 30 candy bars each at the rate of one shilling, they could shorten it to 30 candy bars at one shilling. That way, buyers and sellers easily knew if all those candy bars cost one dollar or 30. Since each at was the phrase being abbreviated, the symbol looks like an A inside of an E. No one can say for sure if this is where the at symbol started, but it's certainly where the symbol was first widely used. But it still wasn't popular or commonly used. In fact, the very first typewriters and punch card systems didn't even bother to include an at key. But that started to change around the turn of the century, when it was added to the successful Underwood No. 5 model typewriter. Even though it managed to cling to keyboard life, it remained relatively unused for another 70 years. That's when, in 1971, a computer scientist named Ray Tomlinson was tasked with figuring out how to send an electronic message over a new government system called ARPANET, which was the forerunner to the internet. Basically, Tomlinson was trying to figure out how to make email work he needed some sort of symbol to separate an individual address from the address of the email server. The symbol needed to be one thing that wasn't already being used in another computer program for other functions. He considered an exclamation point, or a comma, or an equal sign, but ultimately landed on our swirly little friend. The rest, as they say, was history. From then on, the symbol was always included on computer keyboards. ARPANET eventually morphed into the internet, and a few decades later, email took off, and the at symbol with it. Today, we use it for hashtags, handles, and Twitter beefs too, making it even more popular. Now, have all those emails and at replies ruined all our lives? Well, I guess we'll find out. What does the US flag mean? June 14th, 1777, not even a year after signing the Declaration of Independence, the flag resolution was passed in the US. It said that, quote, the flag of the United States be 13 stripes, alternate red and white, that the Union be 13 stars, white in a blue field, representing a new constellation. Huzzah, a flag was born. Since that first design with 13 stars, the American flag has been updated 26 different times. The 13 alternating stripes have always stayed the same, but the size, shape, design, arrangement, and number of stars has slowly changed as more and more areas gained official statehood. Today, the flag looks the same as it has since 1960, the last time the flag was changed to add the 49th and 50th stars after Alaska and Hawaii became states. It has 13 horizontal stripes that alternate color, seven red and six white. Those stripes are meant to symbolize the original 13 colonies. The stars, of course, represent the 50 states that make up the country. There are nine rows alternating between five and six stars. Even the color choices themselves are meant to be symbolic. Red is meant to stand for hardiness and valor, white for purity and innocence, and blue for vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Since the United States flag has stayed exactly the same for most of our lives, it can be hard to imagine it ever changing again. But it's possible. There are places like Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa that are territories of the U.S., but aren't fully-fledged states as of 2022. If any of them were ever to gain full statehood, like Alaska and Hawaii before them, then surely the flag would be updated to add extra stars for the new states. Speaking of states, ever since the 1700s, they've slowly adopted their own flags too often designing them to reflect the land, people, and culture of the state. 
and it definitely doesn't stop at the state level. Cities, towns, communities, and schools often have their own flags to fly with pride. So this 4th of July, fly whatever represents you. And if you can't find that, well, make your own flag. Why do we always eat popcorn at the movies? Back before the big screen was invented, popcorn was a popular snack at carnivals and fairgrounds around the United States. By the late 1800s, the popcorn making machine was invented, and it became even easier to make and sell the stuff. Popcorn was super cheap and super popular, but it wasn't exactly fancy. So when the first movie theaters opened around 1900, they wanted nothing to do with the delicious salty snack. You see, movie theaters were seen as a newfangled version of the classic theater, which has a distinctly fancy feel to it. <clears throat> no normal theater would ever allow such a loud and messy food into its performances, <clears throat> so movie theater owners did the same. <laughs> but all that changed in 1927, when the very first films with sound, called talkies, came out. Now, movies were no longer trying to mimic the sophisticated theater experience and became popular entertainment for everyone. So movie theaters changed their whole vibe. Instead of trying to be fancy like the traditional theater, movie theaters became cheap and easy entertainment for people rich and poor, and popular popcorn was the perfect inexpensive food to go with a film. Early theaters didn't have the space to add popcorn concession stands, so street vendors quickly started posting up outside theaters. After a few years, some vendors started paying a fee to theaters to sell their popcorn right in the lobby to catch the crowds as people entered a movie. Eventually, the theater owners realized they could cut out the middleman and sell popcorn themselves. Popcorn became a must-have for any movie theater. It was so popular that theaters who didn't sell it had trouble attracting moviegoers. But the relationship between popcorn and the movies was really set in stone during World War II. Things like chocolate and sugar were rationed during the war, which made it hard to get candy. But salt and popcorn kernels were never rationed. So the country's favorite movie theater treat was even more available and even more popular. Ever since, popcorn and movies have continued to be as iconic as any duo out there. The only difference? Those buckets keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and I'm okay with it. What was the very first cartoon ever made? Animation itself might be a fairly new invention, but people have been trying to make pictures come to life for a long time. Take cave paintings, for example. Most of them show animals in sequence with their legs in different positions, clearly trying to show motion. Devices throughout history have attempted to capture the magic of motion even before the invention of film. The Phenakistoscope was invented in 1832 and became the first popular animation device that could create the illusion of movement. It worked like a really fancy flipbook. A spinning cardboard disc with a series of pictures on it was attached to a handle, and when spun, created a little looped animation, kind of like the 1800s version of a GIF. Just two years after that, in 1834, the zoetrope was invented. <laughs> this contraption was similar to the phenakistoscope, but instead of being on a disc, the pictures are on a paper strip. The paper is wrapped around the inside of a drum, which has slits cut into the side across from each picture. The big drum is spun faster and faster, making the motion seem fluid and natural. Other doodads like the praxinoscope and the theatre optique kept pushing the technology along, and before long, the film camera was invented, and it was off to the races from there. Okay, so that's how people brought pictures to life before cartoons, but what was the very first one? Well, that honor goes to a French cartoon from 1908 called Phantasmagorie. The film is under a minute and a half long and has no sound. It's a story about a stick figure man who interacts with objects that morph and change. The very first hand-drawn animated feature film with both sound and color was Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves in 1937. The film was a huge success and led Disney to make many more iconic animated movies. 
Cartoons finally found some success on TV in the 1960s when TV stations started airing them on Saturday mornings when kids could easily watch them. And from there, it was off to the races. So next time you're watching cartoons, remember to thank your cave ancestors for getting the ball rolling. Why are hit movies called blockbusters? Nowadays, Blockbuster is a word usually reserved for big-budget studio films that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make and expect to bring in hundreds of millions more. But the term actually goes back farther than you might imagine, to the 1940s during World War II. Apparently, the original blockbusters weren't major motion pictures with massive special effects and monumental explosions, they were just really big explosions, like real ones. That's right, the term originally had nothing to do with how much a movie made. It described a big bomb that got its name because, well, it could bust an entire city block. Yeah, not great. As the big blockbusting bombs kept being used throughout the rest of the war, the term caught on and became more widespread. The word made its way from the battlefield to everyday life, where people started using it here and there to refer to anything particularly explosive or over the top. Finally, by the 1950s, people started using the term blockbuster mostly just to describe big budget movies with mass appeal and major returns at the box office. Maybe the first example of a movie that was widely considered to be a blockbuster was Jaws, way back in 1975. The classic flick about a shark attack raked in ticket sales and had people lining up around the block to get in. Ever since, the movie industry has only put more and more effort into turning as many movies and franchises as they can into blockbusters, with mixed results. So, sit back, have some popcorn, and try to enjoy the ride, because Blockbuster Fever isn't ending anytime soon. Who actually invented the floss dance? If you managed to somehow miss the newest internet dance craze, it's called the floss, and it has nothing to do with keeping your teeth clean. To do the floss, you just make fists, let your arms hang straight at your sides, and swing them left and right around your torso in the opposite direction of your hips. Expert flossers might throw in some extra flurries or other dance moves for a little more pageantry, but that's the basic move. Okay, now that you know how to floss, let's find out where it started. Well, nobody can say for sure who actually invented the dance move, but what we do know is who popularized it. His name is The Backpack Kid, and he posted a video on Instagram in August of 2016 that featured him doing the dance move. Over the next year or two, the dance slowly gained popularity until Katy Perry got involved in May of 2017 and sent the dance into the stratosphere. While performing on SNL, Katy invited the Backpack Kid on stage to dance the floss while she sang Swish Swish. The internet loved it, and from there it was off to the races. YouTube remixes and tutorials were suddenly all over the place. And just when you thought the dance couldn't get any more viral, Fortnite got involved. And since there's nothing out there more popular than Fortnite, the dance is destined to stick around for a long, long time.